All right, guys, and we're back with part three of the case of Charles Dexter Ward, or at least part three. I mean, we're technically on chapter four in here, which is called A Mutation and a Madness, which sounds very foreboding, but I'm sure it'll be fun. Anyway, let's get started. In the week following that Memorial Good Friday, Charles Ward was seen more often than usual and was continually carrying books between his library and the attic laboratory. His actions were quiet and rational, but he had a furtive, hunted look which his mother did not like and developed an incredibly ravenous appetite as gauged by his demands upon the cook. Dr. Willett had been told of those Friday noises and happenings and on the following Tuesday had a long conversation with the youth in the library where the picture stared no more. Their interview was, as always, inconclusive, but Willett is still ready to swear that the youth was sane in himself at the time. He held out promises of an early revelation and spoke of the need of securing a lab laboratory elsewhere. Sorry, I keep slipping between laboratory and laboratory. I don't know. At the loss of the portrait, he grieved singularly little, considering his first enthusiasm over it, but seemed to find something of positive humor in its sudden crumbling. About the second week, Charles began to be absent from the house for long periods, and one day... When good old Black Hannah came to help out with spring cleaning, God, I hate that so much. I know this was back in different times, but still. She mentioned his frequent visits to the old house in Only Court, where he would come with a large valise and perform curious delvings in the cellar. He was always very liberal to her and to old Asa, but seemed more worried than he used to be, which grieved her very much, since she had watched him grow up from birth. Another report of his doings came from Pawtucket, where some friends of the family saw him at a distance a surprising number of times. He seemed to haunt the resort and canoe house of Rhodes on the Pawtucket, um, and subsequent inquiries by Dr. Willard at that place brought out the fact that his purpose was always to secure access to the rather hedged-in riverbank along which he would walk towards the north, usually not reappearing for a very long while. Later in May came a momentary revival of ritualistic sounds in the attic laboratory, which brought a stern repro reproof from Mr. Ward and a somewhat distracted promise of amendment from Charles. It occurred one morning and seemed to form a resumption of the imaginary conversation noted on that turbulent Good Friday. The youth was arguing or remonstrating hotly with himself, for there suddenly burst forth a perfectly distinguishable series of of clashing shouts in differentiated tones, like alternate demands and denials, which caused Miss Ward to run upstairs and listen at the door. She could hear no more than a fragment of whose play, only plain words were, must have it read for three months, and upon her knocking all sounds ceased at once. When Charles was later questioned by his father, he said that there were certain conflicts of spheres of consciousness which only great skill could avoid, but which he would try to transfer to other realms. That sounds promising. About the middle of June, a queer nocturnal incident occurred. In the early evening, there had been some noise and thumping in the laboratory upstairs, and Mr. Ward was on the point of investigating when it suddenly quieted down. That midnight, after the family had retired, the butler was night-locking the front door when, according to his statement, Charles appeared somewhat blunderingly and uncertainly at the foot of the stairs with a large suitcase and made signs that he wished egress. The youth spoke no word, but the worthy Yorkshireman caught one sight of his fevered eyes and trembled causelessly. He opened the door and young Ward went out, but in the morning he presented his resignation to Mrs. Ward. There was, he said, something unholy in the glance Charles had fixed on him. It was no way for a young gentleman to look at an honest person, and he could not possibly stay another night. Ms. Ward allowed the man to depart, but she did not devalue his statements highly. To fancy Charles in a savage state that night was quite ridiculous, for as long as she had remained awake, she had heard faint sounds from the laboratory above, sounds as if of sobbing and pacing, and of sighing which told only of despair's profoundest depths. Miss Ward had grown used to listening for sounds in the night, for the mystery of her son was fast driving all else from her mind. The next evening, much as on another evening nearly three months before, Charles Ward seized the newspaper very early and accidentally lost the main section. This matter was not recalled till later when Dr. Willett began checking up loose ends and searching out missing links here and there. In the journal office, he found the section which Charles had lost and marked two items of possible significance. They were as follows. 
More cemetery delving. It was this morning, discovered by Robert Hart, night watchman at the North Burial Ground, that ghouls were again at work in the ancient portion of the cemetery. The grave of Ezra Wheaton, who was born in 1740 and died in 1824, according to his uprooted and savagely splintered slate headstone, was found excavated and rifled, the work being evidently done with a spade stolen from an adjacent tool shed. Whatever the contents may have been after more than a century of burial, all was gone except a few slivers of decayed wood. There were no wheel tracks, but the police have measured a single set of footprints which they found in the vicinity, and which indicate the boots of a man of refinement. Hart is inclined to link this incident with the digging discovered last March, when a party in a motor truck were frightened away after making a deep excavation. But Sergeant Riley of the second station discounts this theory and points to vital differences in the two cases. In March, the digging had been in a spot where no grave was known, but this time a well-marked and cared-for grave had been rifled with every evidence of deliberate purpose. And with conscious malignity expressed in the splintering of the slab, which had been attacked up to the day before. Members of the Whedon family, notified of what happened, expressed their astonishment and regret, and were wholly unable to think of any enemy who would care to violate the grave of their ancestors. Hazard Whedon of 598 Angel Street recalls a family legend according to which Ezra Whedon was involved in some very peculiar circumstances, not dishonorable to himself, shortly before the revolution, but of any modern feud or mystery he is frankly ignorant. Inspector Cunningham had been assigned to the case in hopes to uncover some valuable clues in the near future. Dogs noisy in Pawtucket. Residents of Pawtucket were aroused about 3 a.m. today by a phenomenal bang of dogs which seemed to center just out near the river just north of Rhodes on the Pawtucket. The volume and quality of the howling were unusually odd, according to most who heard it, and Fred Lemden, night watchman at Rhodes, declares it was mixed with something very like the shrieks of a man in mortal terror and agony. A sharp and very brief thunderstorm, which seemed to strike somewhere near the bank of the river, put an end to the disturbance. Strange as unpleasant odors, probably from the oil tanks along the bay, are popularly linked with this incident. It may have had their share in exciting the dogs. The aspect of Charles now became very haggard and hunted, and all agreed in retrospect that he may have wished at this period to make some statement or confession from which sheer terror withheld him. The morbid listening of his mother in the night brought out the fact that he made frequent sallies abroad under the cover of darkness, and most of the more academic alienists unite at present in charging him with the revolting cases of vampirism which the press so sensationally reported about this time, but which have not yet been definitely traced to any known perpetrator. These cases, too recent and celebrated to need detailed mention, involve victims of every age and type, and seem to cluster around two distinct localities, the residential hill in the north end, near the ward home, and the suburban districts across the Cranston line near Pawtucket. Both late wayfarers and sleepers with open windows were attacked, and those who lived to tell the tales spoke unanimously unanimously of a lean, lithe, leaping monster with burning eyes which fastened its teeth in the throat or upper arm and feasted ravenously. Dr. Willett, who refuses to date the madness of Charles Ward as far back as even this, is cautious in attempting to explain these horrors. He has, he declares, certain theories of his own and limits his positive statements to a peculiar kind of negation. I will not, he says, state who or what I believe perpetrated these attacks and murders, but I will declare that Charles Ward was innocent of them. I have reason to be sure he was ignorant of the taste of blood, as indeed his continued anemic decline and increasing pallor prove better than any verbal argument. Ward meddled with terrible things, but he has paid for it, and he was never a monster or a villain. As for now, I don't like to think. A change came, and I'm content to believe that the old Charles Ward died with it. His soul did, anyhow, for that mad flesh that vanished from Waits Hospital had another. Willett speaks with authority, for he was often at the ward home attending Ms. Ward, whose nerves had begun to snap under the strain. Her nocturnal listening had bred some morbid hallucinations which she confided to the doctor with hesitancy, and which he ridiculed in talking to her. Although they made him ponder deeply when alone, these delusions always concerned the faint sounds when she fancied she heard uh, which she fancied she'd heard in the attic laboratory and bedroom, and emphasized the occurrences of muffled sighs and sobbings at the most impossible times. Early in July, Willett ordered Miss Ward to Atlantic City for an indefinite recuperative sojourn, 
and cautioned both Mr. Ward and the haggard and elusive Charles to write her only cheering letters. It is probably to this enforced and reluctant escape that she owes her life and continued sanity. Not long after his mother's departure, Charles Ward began negotiating for the Pawtucket bungalow. It was a squalid little wooden edifice with a concrete garage, perched high on the sparsely settled bank of the river slightly above Rhodes, but for some odd reason the youth would have nothing else. He gave the real estate agencies no peace till one of them secured it for him at an exorbitant price from a somewhat reluctant owner, and as soon as it was vacant he took possession under cover of darkness, transporting in, great closed, in a great closed van the entire contents of his attic laboratory, including the books both weird and modern which he had borrowed from his study. He had this van loaded in the black small hours, and his father recalls only a drowsy realization of stifled oaths and stamping feet on the night the goods were taken away. After that, Charles moved back to his own quarters on the third floor and never haunted the attic again. To the Pawtucket bungalow, Charles transferred all the secrecy with which he had surrounded his attic realm, save that he now appeared to have two sharers in his mystery. A villainous-looking Portuguese half-caste from the South Main Street waterfront who acted as a servant, and a thin scholarly stranger with dark glasses and a stubbly full beard of dyed aspect whose status was evidently that of a colleague. Neighbors vainly tried to engage these odd persons in conversation. The mulatto gnomes spoke very little English, and the bearded man who gave his name as Dr. Allen voluntarily followed his example. Ward himself tried to be more affable, but succeeded only in provoking curiosity with his rambling accounts of chemical research. Before long, queer tales began to circulate regarding the all-night burning of the lights, and somewhat later, after this burning had suddenly ceased, there rose still queerer tales of disproportionate orders of meat from the butchers and of muffled shouting, declamation, rhythmic chanting, and screaming supposed to come from some very deep cellar below the place. Most distinctly, and the new and strange household was bitterly disliked by the honest bourgeoisie of the vicinity, and it is not remarkable that dark hints were advanced, advanced connecting the hated establishment with the current epidemic of vampiristic attacks and murders, especially since the radius of that plague seemed now confined wholly to Pawtucket in the adjacent streets of Edgewood. Ward spent most of his time at the bungalow, but slept occasionally at home and was still reckoned a dweller beneath his father's roof. Twice he was absent from the city on week-long trips, whose destinations have not yet been discovered. He grew steadily paler and more emaciated even than before, and lacked some of his former assurance when repeating to Dr. Willett his old, old story of vital research and future revelations. Willett often waylaid him at his father's house, for the elder ward was deeply worried and perplexed, and wished his son to get as much sound oversight as could be managed in the case of so secretive and independent an adult. The doctor still insists that the youth was sane, even as late as this, and adduces many a conversation to prove his point. About September, the vampirism declined, but in the following January, Ward almost became involved in a serious trouble. For some time, the nocturnal arrival and departure of motor trucks at the Pawtucket bungalow had been commented upon, and at this juncture, an unforeseen hitch exposed the nature of at least one item in their contents. In a lonely spot near Hope Valley had occurred one of the frequent sordid waylaying of trucks by hijackers in quest of liquor shipments, but this time the robbers had been destined to receive the greater shock. For the long cases they see proved upon opening to contain some exceedingly gruesome things, so gruesome in fact, that the matter could not be kept quiet amongst the denizens of the underworld. The thieves had hastily buried what they had discovered, but when the state police got wind of the matter, a careful search was made. A recently arrested vagrant, under the promise of immunity from prosecution or any additional charge, at last consented to guide a party of troopers to the spot, and there was found in that hasty cache a very hideous and shameful thing. It would not be well for the national, or even the international, sense of decorum if the public were to ever know what was uncovered by that awestruck party. There was no mistaking it. Even by these far from studious officers and telegrams to Washington ensued with feverish rapidity. The cases were addressed to Charles Ward at his Pawtucket bungalow, and state and federal officials once paid him a very forceful and serious call. They found him pallid and worried with his two odd companions, and received from him what seemed to be a valid explanation and evidence of innocence. 
He had needed certain anatomical specimens as a part of a program of research whose depth and genuineness anyone who had known him in the last decade could prove, and had ordered the required kind and number from agencies which he had thought as reasonably legitimate as such things can be. Of the identity of the specimens, he had known absolutely nothing, and was properly shocked when the inspectors hinted at the monstrous effect on public sentiment and national dignity which a knowledge of the matter would produce. In this statement, he was firmly sustained by his bearded colleague, Dr. Allen, whose oddly hollow voice carried even more conviction than his own nervous tones, so that in the end, the, of the, of uh, the officials took no actions, but carefully set down the New York name and address which Ward gave them as a basis for a search which came to nothing. It is only fair to add that the specimens were quickly and quietly restored to their proper places, and the general public will never know of their blasphemous disturbance. On February 9th, 1928, Dr. Willett received a letter from Charles Ward, which he considered, or considers of extraordinary importance, and about which he had frequently quarreled with Dr. Lyman. Lyman believes that this note contains positive proof of a well-developed case of dementia praecox, but Willett, on the other hand, regards it as the last perfectly sane utterance of the hapless youth. He calls a special attention to the normal characters of the penmanship, which, though showing traces of shattered nerves, is nevertheless distinctly Ward's own. The text in full is as follows. Dear Dr. Willett, I feel that at last... I feel that at last the time has come for me to make the disclosures which I have so long promised you, and for which you have pressed me so often. The patience you have shown in waiting and the confidence you have shown in my mind and integrity are things I shall ever cease to appreciate. And now that I am ready to speak, I must own with humiliation that no triumph such as I dreamed can ever be mine. Instead of triumph, I have found terror, and my talk with you will not be a boast of victory, but a plea for help and advice in saving both myself and the world from a horror beyond all human conception or calculation. You recall what those Fenner letters said of the old writ raiding party at Pat Pawtucket. That must all be done again and quickly. Upon us depends more than can be put into words. All civilization, all natural law, perhaps even the fate of the solar system and the universe. I have brought to light a monstrous abnormality, but I did it for the sake of knowledge. Now, for the sake of all life and nature, you must help me thrust it back into the dark again. I have left that Pawtucket place forever, and we must extirpate everything existing there, alive or dead. I shall not go there again, and you must not believe it if you ever hear that I am there. I will tell you why I say this when I see you. I have come home for good, and wish you would call on me at the very first moment that you can spare five or six hours continuously to hear what I have to say. It will take that long. Believe me when I tell you that you never had a more genuine profession, professional duty than this. My life and reason are the very least things which hang in the balance. I dare not tell my father, for he could not grasp the whole thing, but I have told him of my danger, and he has four men from a detective agency watching the house. I don't know how much good they can do, for they have against them forces which even you could scarcely inv envisage or acknowledge. So come quickly if you wish to see me alive, and hear how you may help to save the cosmos from stark hell. Any time will do. I shall not be out of the house. Don't telephone ahead, for there is no telling who or what may try to intercept you. And let us pray to whatever gods that there be nothing that be that nothing may prevent this meeting. In utmost gravity and desperation, Charles Dexter Ward. P.S. Shoot Dr. Allen on sight and dissolve his body in acid. Don't burn it. Okay. That's, um, that's something. Dr. Willett received this note about 10.30 a.m. and immediately arranged to spare the whole late afternoon and evening for the momentous talk, letting it extend into the night as long as it may be necessary. He planned to arrive at f around about 4 o'clock and through all intervening hours was so engulfed in every sort of wild speculation that most of his tasks were very mechanically performed. Maniacal as the letter would have sounded to a stranger, Willett had seen too much of Charles Ward's oddities to dismiss it as sheer raving. That something very subtle, ancient, and horrible was hovering about, he felt sure, and the reference to Dr. Allen could almost be comprehended in view of what Pawtucket gossip said of Ward's 
enigmatical colleague. Willett had never seen the man, but he had heard much of his aspect and bearing, and could not but wonder what sort of eyes those must discuss dark glasses might conceal. Promptly at four, Dr. Willett presented himself at the ward residence, but found to his annoyance that Charles had not adhered to his determination to remain indoors. The guards were there, but they said the young man seemed to have lost part of his timidity. He said the morning done... He had that morning done much apparently frightening, frightened or arguing and protesting over the phone, one of the detectives said, replying to some unknown voice with phrases such as, I am very tired and must rest a while. I can't receive anyone for some time. You'll have to excuse me. Please don't. Please postpone decisive action until we can arrange some sort of compromise. Or, I am very sorry, but I must take a complete vacation from everything. I'll talk with you later. Then, apparently gaining boldness through meditation, he had slipped out so quietly that no one had seen him depart or knew that he had gone until he returned about one o'clock and entered the house without a word. He had gone upstairs, where a bit of his fear must have surged back, for he was heard to cry out in a high, terrified fashion upon entering his library, afterward trailing off into a kind of choking gasp. When, however, the butler had gone to inquire what the trouble was, he had appeared at the door with a great show of boldness and had silently gestured the man away in a manner that terrified him unaccountably. Then he had evidently done some rearranging of the shelves, for a great clattering and thumping and creaking ensued, after which he had reappeared and left at once. Willett inquired whether or not any message had been left, but was told there was none. The butler seemed queerly disturbed about something in Charles's appearance and manner, and asked solic solic solicitously if there was much hope for a cure of his disordered nerves. For almost two hours, Dr. Willett waited vainly in Charles Ward's library, watching the dusty shelves with their wide gaps where books had been removed, and smiling grimly at the paneled overmantel on the north wall, whence a year before the suave features of old Joseph Kerwin had looked mildly down. After a time, the shadows began to gather, and the sunset cheer gave place to a vague, growing terror which flew shadow-like before the night. Mr. Ward finally arrived. It showed much surprise and anger at his son's absence, after all the pains which had been taken to guard him. He had not known of Charles's appointment, and promised to notify Willett when the youth returned. In bidding the doctor good night, he expressed his utter perplexity at his son's condition, and urged his caller to do all he could to restore the boy to normal poise. Well, it was glad to escape from that library, for something frightful and unholy seemed to haunt it, as if the vanished picture had left behind a legacy of evil. He had never liked that picture, and even now, strong nerve though he was, there lurked a quality in its vacant panel which made him feel an urgent need to get out into the pure air as soon as possible. The next morning, Willett received a message from the senior ward saying that Charles was still absent, Ward mentioned that Dr. Allen had telephoned him to say that Charles would remain at Pawtucket for some time, and that he must not be disturbed. This was necessary because Allen himself was suddenly called away for an indefinite period, leaving the researches in need of Charles's constant oversight. Charles sent his best wishes, and regretted any bother his abrupt change of plans might have caused. In listening to this message, Do Mr. Ward heard Dr. Allen's voice for the first time, and it seemed to excite some vague and elusive memory from... Uh, which could not actually be placed, but which was disturbing to the point of fearfulness. Faced by these baffling and contradictory reports, Dr. Willett was frankly at a loss of what to do. The frantic earnestness of Charles's note was not to be denied, yet what could one think of its writer's immediate violation of his own expressed policy? Young Ward had written that his delvings had become blasphemous, menacing, and that they, they and his bearded colleague must be extirpated at any cost, and that he himself would never return to their final scene. Yet according to latest advices, he had forgotten all of this and was back in the thick of the mystery. Common sense bade one leave the youth alone with his freakishness, yet some deeper instinct would not permit the impression of that frenzied letter to subside. Well, it read it over again, and could not make essence, its essence sound as empty and insane as both its bombastic verbiage and its lack of fulfillment would seem to imply. Its terror was too profound and real, and in conjunction with what the doctor already knew, evoked too vivid hints of monstrosities from beyond time and space to per permit of any cynical explanation. There were nameless horrors abroad, and no matter how little one might be able to get at them, one ought to stand prepared for any sort of action at any time. For over a week, Dr. Willett pondered on the dilemma which seemed thrust upon him, 
and became more and more inclined to pay Charles a call at the Pawtucket bungalow. No friend of the youth had ever ventured to storm this forbidden retreat, and even his father knew of its interior only from such descriptions as he chose to give, but Willett felt that some direct conversation with his patient was necessary. Mr. Ward had been receiving brief and noncommittal typed notes from his son, and said that Ms. Ward, in her Atlantic City retirement, had no better word. So at length the doctor resolved to act, and despite a curious sensation inspired by old legends of Joseph Kerwin, and by more recent revelations and warnings from Charles Ward, set boldly out for the bungalow on the bluff above the river. Willett had visited the spot before through sheer curiosity, though of course never entering the house or proclaiming his presence, hence knew exactly the route to take. Driving out by Broad Street one early afternoon towards the end of February in his small motor, he thought oddly of the grim party which had taken that selfsame road 157 years before, on a terrible errand which none might ever comprehend. The ride through the city's decaying fringe was short, and Trim Edgeworth and Sleepy Pawtucket presently spread out ahead. Willett turned to the right down Lockwood Street and drove his car as far along that rural road as he could, and then alighted and walked north where the bluff towered above the lovely bends of the river and the sweep of the misty downlands beyond. Houses were still few here, and there was no mistaking the isolated bungalow with its concrete garage on a high point of land at his left. Stepping briskly up the neglected gravel walk, he rapped at the door with a firm hand and spoke without tremor to the evil Portuguese mulatto who opened the, it to the width of a crack. He must, he said, see Charles Ward at once on vitally important business. No excuse would be accepted, and a repulse would mean only a full report of the matter to the elder Ward. The mulatto still hesitated and pushed against the door when Willett attempted to open it, but the doctor merely raised his voice and renewed his demands. Then there came from the dark interiors a husky whisper which somehow chilled the hearer through and through, though he did not know why he feared it. Let him in, Tony, it said. May as well talk now as ever. But disturbing as the, but disturbing as was the whisperer, the greater fear was that which immediately followed. The floor creaked, and the speaker hove, hove in sight. And the owner of the strange, resonant tones was seen to be n uh, none other than Charles Dexter Ward. The minuteness with which Doctor Willett recalled and recorded his conversation of that afternoon is due to the importance he assigned to this particular period. For at last he concedes a vital change in Charles Dexter Ward's mentality and believes that the youth now spoke from a brain hopelessly alien to the brain whose growth he had watched for six and twenty years. Controversy with Dr. Lyman had compel compelled him to be very specific, and he definitely dates the madness of Charles Ward from the time the typewritten note to began to reach his parents. Those notes are not in Ward's normal style, not even in the style of that last frantic letter to Willett. Instead, they are strange and archaic, as if the snapping of the writer's mind had released a flood of tendencies and impressions picked up unconsciously through boyhood antiquarianism. There is an obvious effort to be modern, but the spirit and occasionally the language are those of the past. The past, too, was evident in Ward's every tone and gesture as he received the doctor in that shadowy bungalow. He bowed, motioned Willett to a seat, and began to speak abruptly in that strange whisper which he sought to explain at the very outset. I am grown <sighs> physical, he said. He began, from this cursed river air. You must excuse my speech. I suppose you are come from my father to see what ails me, and I hope you will say nothing to alarm him. Willett was studying these scraping tones with extreme care, but studying even more closely the face of the speaker. Something he felt was wrong, and he thought of what the family had told him about the fright of that Yorkshire butler one night. He wished it were not so dark, but did not request that any blind be open. Instead, he merely asked Ward why he had so belied the frantic note of little more than a week ago. I was coming to that, the host replied. You must know I am in a very bad state of nerves, and I do and say queer things I cannot account for. As I have oft told you often, I am on the edge of great matters, and the bigness of them has a way of making me light-headed. Any man might well be frightened of what have I have found, but I am not to be put off for long. I was a dunce to have that guard and stick at home. For having gone this far, my place is here. I am not well spoke of by my prying neighbors, and perhaps I was led by weakness to believe myself what they say of me. 
There is no evil to any in what I do. And so long as I do it rightly, have the goodness to wait six months and I'll show you what will pay your patience well. You may as well know I have a way of learning old matters from things surer than books, and I'll leave you to judge the importance of what I can give to history, philosophy, and the arts by reason of the doors I have access to. My ancestors had all this when those witless peeping toms came and murdered him. I now have it again, or I am coming very imperfectly to have a part of it. This time, nothing must happen, and least through of all the, through any idiot fears of my own. Pray forget all I writ you, sir, and have no fear of this place or any in it. Dr. Allen is a man of fine parts, and I owe him an apology for anything ill I have said of him. I wish I had no need to spare him, but there were things he had to do elsewhere. His zeal is equal to mine in all those matters, and I suppose that when I feared the work, I feared him too, as my greatest helper in it. Wart paused, and the doctor hardly knew what to say or think. He felt almost foolish in the face of this calm repudi repudiation of the letter, and yet there clung to him the fact that while the present discourse was strange and alien and indubitably mad, the note itself had been tragic in its naturalness and likeness to the Charles Ward he knew. Will Willett now tried to turn the talk on early matters and recall to the youth some past events which would restore a familiar mood, but this process he obtained in this process he obtained only the most grotesque results. It was the same with all the alienists later on. Important sections of Charles Ward's store of mental images, mainly those touching modern times and his own personal life, had been unaccountably expunged, while all the massed antiquarianism in his youth had welled up from some profound subconscious to engulf the contemporary of the individual. The youth's ultimate knowledge of older things was abnormal and unholy, and he tried his best to hide it. When Willett would mention some favorite object of his boyhood archaistic studies, he often, he often shed by pure accident such a light as no normal mortal could conceivably be expected to possess, and the doctor shuddered as the glib illusion glided by. It was not wholesome to know so much about the way the fat sheriff's wig fell off as he leaned over in the play of Mr. Douglas's Histeronic Academy in King Street on the 11th of February, 1762, which fell on a Thursday, or about how the actors cut the text of the Steele's Conscious Lover so badly that one was almost glad that the Baptist-ridden legislature closed the theater a fortnight later. That Thomas Sebin's coach, or Boston coach, was damned uncomfortable, old letters may well have told. But what healthy antiquarian could recall how the creaking of Epinetus Olney's new signboard, the gaudy crown he set up after he took to calling his tavern the Crown Coffee House, was exactly like the first few notes of the new jazz piece all the radios in Pawtucket were playing. Ward, however, would not be quizzed long in this vein. Modern and personal topics he waved aside summarily, whilst regarding antique affairs he soon showed the plainest boredom. What he wished clearly enough was only to satisfy his visitor enough to make him depart without the intention of returning. To this end, he offered to show Willett the entire house, and at once proceeded to lead the doctor through every room from cellar to attic. Willett looked sharply, but noted that the visible books were far too few and trivial to have ever filled the wide gaps on Ward's its shelves at home, and that the meager so-called laboratory was the flimbiest, flimsiest sort of, sort of a blind. Clearly, there were a library and laboratory elsewhere, but just where was impossible to say. Essentially defeated in his quest for something he could not name, Willett returned to town before evening and told Senior Ward everything which had occurred. They agreed that the youth must definitely be out of his mind, but decided that nothing drastic need to be done just then. Above all, Miss Ward must be kept in complete ignorance, as her son's own strange typed notes would permit. Mr. Ward now determined to call in person upon his son, making it a wholly a surprise visit. Dr. Willett took him by his, in his car one evening, guiding him to within sight of the bungalow and, waited, and waiting patiently for his return. The session was a long one, and the father emerged in a very saddened and perplexed state. His reception had developed much like Willett's, save that Charles had been an excessively long time in appearing after the visitor had forced his way into the hall and sent the Portuguese away with an imperative demand. And in the bearing of the altered son, there was no trace of filial affection. The lights had been dim, yet even so, the youth had complained that they dazzled him outrageously. 
He had not spoken out loud at all, averring to that his throat was in very poor condition, but in his hoarse whisper there was a quality so vaguely disturbing that Mr. Ward could not banish it from his mind. Now definitely leagued together to do all that they could towards the young youth's mental salvation, Mr. Ward and Dr. Willett set about collecting every scrap of data which the case might afford. Pawtucket gossip was the first item they studied, and this was relatively easy to glean since both had friends in that region. Dr. Willett obtained the most rumors because people talked more frankly to him than to the parent of the central figure, and from all he heard he could tell that young Ward's life had, become, had indeed become a strange one. Common tongues would not dissociate his household from the vampirism of the previous summer, while the nocturnal comings and goings of the motor trucks provided their share of dark speculation. Local tradesmen spoke of the queerness of the orders brought to them by the evil-looking mulatto, and in particular of the inordinate amounts of meats and fresh blood secured from the two butcher shops in the immediate neighborhood. For a household of only three, these quantities were quite absurd. Then there was the matter of the sounds beneath the earth. Reports of these things were harder to pin down, but all the vague hints tallied in certain basic essentials. Noises of a ritual nature positively existed, and at times when the bungalow was dark, they might, of course, have come from the known cellar, but rumor insisted there, there were deeper and more spreading crypts. Recalling the ancient tales of Joseph Kerwin's catacombs, and assuming for granted that the present bungalow had been selected because of its situation on the old Kerwin site, as revealed in one or another of the document found behind the picture, Willett and Mr. Ward gave this phase of the gossip much attention, and searched many times without success for the door in the riverbank which old manuscripts mentioned. As to popular opinions of the bungalow's various inhabitants, it was soon plain that Brava Portuguese with no, that the Brava Portuguese was loathed, the bearded and spectacled Dr. Allen feared, and the pallid young scholar disliked to a profound extent. During the last week or two, Ward had obviously changed much, abandoning his attempts at the affability and speaking only in hoarse but oddly repellent whispers. On few occasions, he ventured forth. Such were the shreds and fragments gathered here and there. And over these, Mr. Ward and Dr. Willett held many long and serious conferences. They strove to exercise deduction, induction, and constructive imagination to their utmost extent, and to correlate every known fact of Charles's later life, including the frantic letter which the doctor now showed the father, with the meager documentary evidence available concerning old Joseph Kerwin. They would have given much for a glimpse of the papers Charles had found, for very clearly the key to the youth's madness lay in what he had learned of the ancient wizard and his doings. And yet, after all, it was from no step of Mr. Ward's or Dr. Willett's that the next move in this singular case proceeded. The father and the physician, rebuffed and confused by a shadow too shapeless and intangible to combat, had rested uneasily on their oars, while the typed notes of young Ward to his parents grew fewer and fewer. Then came the first of the month, with its customary financial adjustments, and the clerks at certain banks began a peculiar shaking of heads and telephoning from one to the other. Officials who knew Charles Ward by sight went down to the bungalow to ask why every check of his appearing at this juncture was a clumsy forgery, and were reassured less, less than they ought to have been when the youth hoarsely explained that his hand had lately been so much affected by nervous shock as to make normal writing impossible. He could, he said, form no written characters at all except with great difficulty, and could prove it by the fact that he had been forced to type all his recent letters, even those to his father and mother, who would bear out the assertions. What made the investigators pause in confusion was not the circumstance alone, for that was nothing unprecedented or fundamentally suspicious, nor even the Pawtucket gossip, of which one or two of them had caught echoes. It was the muddled discourse of the young man who, which nonplussed them, implying as it did a virtually total loss of memory concerning important monetary matters which he had at his fingertips only a month or two before. Something was wrong, for despite the apparent coherence and rationality of his speech, there could be no normal reason for this ill-concealed blankness on vital points. Moreover, although none of these men knew Ward very well, they could not help observing the change in his language and manner. They had heard he was an antiquarian, but even the most hopeless antiquarians do not make use of obsolete phraseology and gestures. Although this combination of hoarseness, palsied hands, bad memory, altered speech, and bearing represented some disturbance or malady of genuine gravity, which, no doubt, 
formed the basis of the prevailing odd rumors, and after their departure, the party officials decided to have a talk with the senior ward was imperative. So on the 6th of March, 1928, there was a long and serious conference in Mr. Ward's office, after which the utterly bewildered father summoned Dr. Willett in a kind of helpless resignation. Willett looked over the strained and awkward signatures of the checks and compared them in his mind with the penmanship of that last frantic note. Certainly the change was radical and profound, yet there was something damnably familiar about the new writing. It had crabbed and archaic tendencies of a stroke utterly different from that which the youth had always used. It was strange, but where had he seen it before? On the whole, it was obvious that Charles was insane. Of that, there could be no doubt. And since it appeared unlikely that he could handle his property or continue to deal with the outside world much longer, something must quickly be done towards his oversight and possible cure. It was then that the alienists who were called in, Doctors Peck and Waite of Providence, and Doctors Lyman of Boston, to whom Mr. Ward and Dr. Willett gave the most exhaustive possible history on the case, and who conferred at length in the now unused library of the young patient, examining what books and papers were left in order to gain some further notion of his habitual mental cast. After scanning this material and examining the youth's note to Willett, they all agreed that Charles Ward's studies had been enough to unseat or at least to warp any ordinary intellect, and wished most heartily that they could see his more intimate volumes and documents. But this latter they knew they could do, if at all, only after a scene at the bungalow itself. Willett now reviewed the whole case with febrile energy, it being at this time that he obtained the statements of the workmen who had seen Charles find the Kerwin documents, and that he collated the incident of the destroyed newspaper items, looking up at the latter at the journal office. On Thursday, the 8th of March, Dr. Willett, Peck, Lyman, Waite, accompanied by Mr. Ward, paid the youth their momentous call, making no concealment of their object and questioning the now-acknowledged patient with extreme minuteness. Charles, though he was inordinately um, long in answering the summons and was still redolent of strange and noxious laboratory odors when he did finally make his agitated appearance, proved a far from recalcitrant subject and admitted freely that his memory and balance had suffered somewhat from close application to abstruse studies. He offered no resistance when his removal to other quarters was insisted upon and seemed, indeed, to display a high degree of intelligence as part as apart from mere memory. His conduct would have sent his interviewers away in bafflement had not the persistently archaic trend of his speech and unmistakable replacement of modern by ancient ideas in his consciousness marked him out as one definitely removed from the normal. Of his work, he would say no more to the group of doctors than he had formerly said to his family and to Dr. Willett, and his fat, frantic note of the previous month he dismissed as mere nerves and hysteria. He insisted that this shadowy bungalow possessed no library or laboratory beyond the visible ones, and waxed abstruse in explaining the absence from the house of such odors now as saturated all of his clothing. Neighborhood gossip he attributed to nothing more than the cheap inventiveness of baffled curiosity. Of the whereabouts of Dr. Allen, he said he did not feel at liberty, liberty to speak definitely, but assured his visitors that the bearded and spectacled man would return when needed. In paying off the stolid brava who resisted all questioning by the visitors, and in closing the bungalow which seemed, still seemed to hold such knighted secrets, Ward showed no sign of nervousness save a barely noticed tendency to pause as though listening for something very faint. He was apparently animated by a calmly philosophic resignation, as if his removal were the merest transient incident which would cause the least trouble if facilitated and disposed of once and for all. It was clear that he trusted to his obviously unimpaired keenness of absolute mentality to overcome all the embarrassments into which, which his twisted memory, his lost voice and handwriting, and his secretive, eccentric behaviors had led him. His mother, it was agreed, was not to be told of the change, uh, his father supplying typed notes in his name. Ward was taken to the restfully and picturesquely situated private hospital maintained by Dr. Waite on Canonicate Island in the Bay, and subjected to the closest scrutiny and questioning by all the physicians connected with the case. It was then that the physical oddities were noticed, the slackened metabolism, the altered skin, and the disproportionate neural reactions. Dr. Willett was the most perturbed of the various examiners, 
for he had attended Ward all his life and could appreciate with terrible keenness the extent of his physical disorganization. Even the familiar olive mark on his hip was gone, while on his chest was a great black mole or cicatrice which had never been there before and which made Willet wonder whether the youth had ever submitted to any of the witch markings reputed to be inflicted at certain unwholesome nocturnal meetings in the wild and lonely places. The doctor could not keep his mind off a certain transcribed witch trial record from Salem, which Charles had shown him in the old non-secretive days, which read, Mr. G.B. on that night put ye devil on his mark upon Bridget S. Jonathan and yeah, a bunch of other people. Ward's face, too, troubled him horribly, till at length he suddenly discovered why he was horrified. Above the young man's right eye was something which he had never previously noticed. A small scar or pit precisely like that in the crumbling painting of old Joseph Kerwin, and perhaps attesting some hideous ritualistic inoculation to which both had submitted at a certain stage of their occult careers. While Ward himself was puzzling, all the doctors at the hospital... A very strict watch was kept on all mail addressed to either him or to Dr. Allen, which Mr. Ward had ordered delivery at the family house. Willett had predicted that little, very little would be found, since any communications of a vital nature would probably have been exchanged by messenger. But in the latter part of March, there did come a letter from Prague for Dr. Allen, which gave both the doctor and the father deep thought. It was in a very crabbed and archaic hand, and though clearly not the effort of a foreigner showed almost as singular a departure from modern English as the speech of young Ward himself. It read, Brother in Almousen Metrotron, the, I this day received your mention of what came up from the salts I sent you. It was wrong, and it means clearly that your headstones had been changed when Barnabas got me the specimen. It is often so, as you must be sensible, of from the thing that you got, ye king's chapel in the ground in 1769, and what you got from old Barry's rearing point in 1690, that was like to end him. I got such a thing from Egypt, 75 years gone, from which came the scar your boy saw on me in 1924. As I told you long ago, do not call up that which you cannot put down, either from dead salts or from out your spheres beyond. Have your words for laying at all times ready, and stop not to be sure when there is any doubt of whom you have. Stones are changed now, the nine grounds out of ten. You're never sure till you question. I, like, I this day heard from H, who had trouble with the soldiers. He is like to be sorry Transylvania has passed from Hungary to Romania, and would change his seat if the castle weren't so full of what we know. But of this he hath doubtless writ you, and my next sending there will be somewhat from a hill tomb from the east that will delight you greatly. Meanwhile, forget I am not desirous of B.F., if you can possibly get him for me. You know G in Philadelphia better than I. Have him up first, if you will, but do not use him so hard, as he will be difficult, for I must speak with him in the end. Yog Sathoth Niblod Zin, Simon O. To Mr. J.C. in Providence. Mr. Ward and Dr. Willett paused in utter chaos before this apparent bit of unrelieved insanity. Only by degrees did they absorb what it seemed to imply. So the absent Dr. Allen, and not Charles Ward, had come to be the leading spirit at Pawtucket? That must explain the wild reference and determination in the youth's last frantic letter. And what of this addressing of the bearded and spectacled stranger as Mr. J.C.? There was no escaping the uh, in inference, but there are limits to possible monstrosity. Who was Simon O., the old man Ward had visited in Prague four years previously? Perhaps... But in the centuries behind that, there's another Simon O, Simon Orne, alias Jedediah of Salem, who vanished in 1771, and whose peculiar handwriting Dr. Willett now unmistakably recognized from the photostatic copies of the Orne formula which Charles had once shown him. What horrors and mysteries, what contradictions and contraventions of nature had come back after a century and a ha half to harass old Providence with her clustered spires and domes? The father and the old physician, virtually at a loss of what to do or think, went to see Charles at the hospital and questioned him as delicately as they could about Dr. Allen, about the Prague visit, and about what he had learned of Simon or Jedediah Orne of Salem. To all these inquiries, the youth was politely noncommittal, merely 
barking in his hoarse whisper that he had found Dr. Allen to have remarkable spiritual rapport with certain souls from the past, and that any correspondent with the bearded man might have in Prague would probably be similarly gifted. When they left, Mr. Ward and Dr. Willett realized to their chagrin that they had really been the ones under the catechism, and that without imparting anything vital himself, the confined youth had adroitly pumped them of everything the Prague letter had contained. Doctors Peck, Waite, and Lyman were not inclined to attach much importance to the strange correspondence of young Ward's companions, for they knew the tendency of kindred eccentrics and monomaniacs to band together, and believed that Charles or Allen had merely unearthed an uh, expatriated counterpart, perhaps one who had seen Orne's handwriting and copied it in an attempt to pose as the bygone character's reincarnation. Allen himself was perhaps a similar case, and may have persuaded the youth into accepting him as an avatar of the long-dead Kerwin. Such things had been known before, and on the same basis, the hard-headed doctors disposed of Willett's growing disquiet about Charles Ward's present handwriting, as studied from the un unpremeditated specimens obtained by various ruses. Willett thought he had placed its odd familiarity at last, and that what it vaguely resembled was the bygone penmanship of old Joseph Kerwin himself, but this the other physicians regarded as a phase of imitativeness only to be expected in a mania of this sort, and refused to grant it any importance, either favorable or unfavorable. Recognizing this prosaic attitude in his colleagues, Willett advised Mr. Ward to keep to himself the letter which arrived for Dr. Allen on the 2nd of April from Raucous, Tra Transylvania, in a handwriting so intensely and fundamentally like that of the Hutchinson cipher that both father and physician pa paused in awe before breaking the seal. This read as follows. Dear C, had a squad of 20 militia up to talk about what the country folks say. Must dig deeper and have less heard. These Romanians plague one damned, one damnably, being officious in particular, where you could buy a magar off with a drink of food. Last month, them got me the sarcophagus of the five sphinxes from Heracropolis, where he whom I'd called up said it would be. And so I had three talks with what was there inhumed. It will go to S.O. and Prague directly, and thence to you. It is, a, it is stubborn, but you know your way is such. You should you show wisdom in having less about than before, for there was no need to keep the guards in shape and eaten off of their heads, and it made much to be found in the case of trouble, as you too well know. You can now move and work elsewhere with no killing trouble if, if needful, though I hope no thing will soon force you to so bothersome a course. I rejoice that you traffic not so much with those outside, for there was ever a mortal peril in it, and you are sensible um, what it did when you asked protection of the one not disposed to give it. You excel me in getting your formula, so another may say them with success, but Borlas fancied it would be so if just the, with the right words were had. Does your boy use them often? I regret that he grows squeamish, as I feared you would when I had him there nigh fifteen months, but I'm sensible that you know how to deal with him. You can't say him down with your formula, for that will work only upon such as your other formula hath called up from the salts, but you still have strong hands and knife and pistol, and graves are not hard to dig, nor acids love to burn. O oh, says you have promised him B.F. I must have him after B goes to you soon. And may he give you what you wish of the dark thing below Memphis. Employ care in what you calls up, and beware of your boy. It will be ripe in a year's time to have up ye legions on the underneath, and there are no bounds to what shall be ours. Have confidence in what I say, for you know Owen I have had these hundred and fifty years more than you to consult these matters in. These matters in. Oh gosh. For J. Kerwin Esquire, Providence. Oh, boy. But if Willett and Mr. Ward refrained from showing this letter to the alienists, they did not refrain from acting upon it themselves. No amount of learned sophistry could controvert the fact that the strangely bearded and spectacled Dr. Allen, of whom Charles's frantic letter had spoken as such a monstrous menace, was in close and sin sinister correspondence with two inexplicable creatures 
whom Warren had visited in his travels and who plainly claimed to be survivals or avatars of Kerwin's old Salem colleagues. That he was regarding himself as the reincarnation of Joseph Kerwin and that he entertained, and or is at least advised to entertain, murderous designs against a boy who could scarcely be other than Charles Ward. There was organized horror afoot, and no matter who had started it, the missing Allen by this time at the bottom of it. Therefore, thanking heaven that Charles was now safe in the hospital, Mr. Ward lost no time in engaging detectives to learn all they could of the cryptic bearded doctor, finding whence he had come and what Pawtucket knew of him, and if possible discovering his current whereabouts. Supplying the men with one of the bungalow keys which Charles had yielded up, he urged them to explore Allen's vacant room which had been identified when the patient's belongings had been packed, obtaining what clues they could from any effects he might have left. Boom, 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 boom. Um, sorry, I got, oh God. Oh, effects he might have left about, yeah. Mr. Ward talked with the detectives in his son's old library, and they felt a marked relief when they left it at last for there seemed to hover about the place a vague aura of evil. Perhaps it was what they had heard of the infamous old wizard, whose picture had once stared from the paneled overmantel, and perhaps it was something different and irrelevant, but in any case, they had all half-sensed an intangible miasma which centered in that carven vestige of an older dwelling at, in which at times almost rose to the intensity of material emanation. Drink really quick. Um. <laughs> All right, there we go. <clears throat> Sorry, sometimes I need to take, like, a quick little break and look at something other than the book, so I stop getting, like, tunnel vision. We're now currently on Chapter 5, and this will probably, I think, be the last chapter we read for this recording. Although it's been going a bit faster. Maybe it's because there's less, like, crazy words right now. 5. Nightmare and a Cataclysm. And now swiftly followed that hideous experience, which has left its indelible mark of fear on the soul of Marinus Bicknell Willett, and has added a decade to the visible age of, the, of one whose youth was even then far behind. Dr. Willett has conferred at length with Mr. Ward and had come to an agreement with him on several points, both of which felt, uh, points with both felt the alienists with ridicule. There was, they conceded, a terrible moment alive in the world, whose direct connection with a necromancy even older than the Salem witchcraft could not be doubted. That at least two living men, and one other of whom they dared not think, were an absolute possession, possession of minds or personalities which had functioned as early as 1690 or before, was likewise, likewise almost unassailably proved, even in the face of all known natural laws. What these horrible creatures, and Charles Ward as well, were doing or trying to do seemed fairly clear from their letters and from every bit of light, both old and new, which had filtered in upon the case. They were robbing the tombs of all ages, including those of the world's wisest and greatest men, in the hopes of recovering from bygone ashes some vestige of the consciousness and lore which had once animated and informed them. A hideous traffic was going on amongst those nightmare ghouls, whereby illustrious bones were bartered with the calm calculativeness of schoolboys swapping books. And from what was extorted from the century dust, there was anticipated a power and a wisdom beyond anything which the cosmos had ever seen concentrated in one man or group. They had found unholy ways to keep their brains alive, either in the same body or different bodies, and had evidently achieved a way of tapping consciousness of the dead whom they gathered together. There had, it seems, been some truth in chimerical old Borellus when he wrote of preparing from even the most antique remains certain essential salts from which the shade of a long-dead living thing might be raised up. There was a formula for evoking such a shade, and another for putting it down, and it had now been so perfected that it could be taught successfully. One must be careful about evocations, for the markers of old graves are not always accurate. Willett and Mr. Ward shivered as they passed from conclusion to conclusion. Things, presences or voices of some sort, 
could be drawn down from unknown places as well as from the grave, and in this process, also one must be careful. Joseph Kerwin had indubitably invoked many forbidden things, and as for Charles, what might one think of him? What forces outside of the spheres had reached him from Joseph Kerwin's day and turned his mind on forgotten things? He had been led to find certain directions, and he had used them. He had talked with the man of horror and praying and stayed long with the creature of the mountains of Transylvania, and he must have found the grave of Joseph Kerwin at last. That newspaper item and what his mother had heard in the night were too significant to overlook. Then he had summoned something, and it must have come. That mighty voice aloft on Good Friday and those different tones had, um, in the locked attic library. What were they with their depth and hollowness? Was there not some, here some evil, awful foreshadowing of the dreaded stranger, Dr. Allen, with his spectral bass? 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 Sorry, everybody. Words. Yes. That was what Mr. Ward had felt with vague horror in his single talk with the man, if man it were, over the telephone. What hellish consciousness or voice, what morbid shade or presence had come to answer Charles Ward's secret rites behind that locked door? Those voices heard in the argument must have read it for three months. Good God, was that not, was that just before the vampirism broke out? The rifling of Ezra Whedon's ancient grave and the cries later at Pawtucket, whose mind had planned the vengeance and rediscovered the shunned seat of elder pla blasphemies, and then the bungalow and the bearded stranger, and the gossip and the fear, the final madness of Charles neither father nor doctor could attempt to explain, but they did feel sure that the mind of Joseph Kerwin had come to earth again and was following its, its ancient morbidities. Was demonic possession in truth a possibility? Alan had something to do with it, and detectives must find out more about one whose existence menaced the young man's life. In the meantime, since the existence of some vast crypt beneath the bungalow seemed virtually beyond dispute, some efforts must be made to find it. Willett and Mr. Ward, conscious of the skeptical attitude of the alienist, resolved during their final conference to undertake a joint exploration of unparalleled thoroughness, and agreed to meet at the bungalow on the following morning with valises and certain tools and accessories suited to architectural search and underground exploration. The morning of April 6th dawned clear, and both explorers were at the bungalow by 10 o'clock. Mr. Ward had the key, and an entry and cursory survey were made. From the disordered condition of Dr. Allen's room, it was obvious from that the detectives had been there before, and the later searches hoped that they had found some clue which might prove of value. Of course, the main business lay in the cellar, so thither they descended without much delay, again making the circuit with each, which each had vainly made before in the presence of the mad young owner. For a time, everything seemed baffling, each inch of the earthen floor and stone walls having so solid and innocuous an aspect that the thought of a yawning aperture was scarcely to be entertained. Willett reflected that, since the original cellar was dug without knowledge of any catacombs beneath, the beginning of the passage would represent a strictly modern delving of young Mord and his associates where they had probed for the ancient vaults whose rumor could have reached them by no wholesome means. The doctor tried to put himself in Charles's place to see how a delver would likely start, but could not gain much inspiration from this method. Then he decided on elimination as a policy, and went carefully over the whole subterranean surface, both vertical and horizontal, trying to account for every inch separately. He was soon substantially narrowed down, and at last had nothing left but a small platform before the wash tubs which he had tried once before in vain. Now experimenting in every way possible and exerting a double strength, he finally found that the top did indeed turn and slide horizontally onto a corner pivot. Beneath it lay a trim, concrete surface with an iron manhole to which Mr. Ward at once rushed with excited zeal. The cover was not hard to lift, and the father had quite removed it when Willett noticed the queerness of his aspect. He was swaying and nodding dizzily, and in the gust of noxious air which swept up at the black pit beneath the doctor soon recognized ample cause. In a moment, Dr. Willett had his fainting companion on the floor above and was reviving him with cold water. Mr. Ward responded feebly, but he could see that the mephitic blast from the crypt had in some way gravely sickened him. 
Wishing to take no chances, Willett hastened out to Broad Street for a taxicab and had soon dispatched the sufferer home despite his weak-voiced protests. After which he produced an electric torch, covered his nostrils with a brand of sterile gauze, and descended once more to peer into the newfound depths. The foul air had now slightly abated, and Willett was able to send a beam of light down the Stygian hole. For about ten feet, he saw it was a sheer cylindrical drop with concrete walls and an iron ladder, after which the hole appeared to strike a flight of old stone steps, which must originally have emerged to earth somewhere southward of the present building. Willett freely admits that for a moment the memory of old Kerwin legends kept him from climbing down alone into that malodorous gulf. He could not help thinking of what Lake Luke Fenner had reported on that last monstrous night. The duty asserted itself, and he made the plunge carrying a great valise for the removal of whatever papers might prove of supreme importance. Slowly, as befitted one of his years, he descended the ladder and reached the slimy steps below. This was ancient masonry, his torch told him, and upon the dripping walls he saw the unwholesome moss of centuries. Down, down ran the steps, not spirally, but in three abrupt turns, and with such narrowness that two men could have passed only with difficulty. He had counted about thirty when a sound reached him very faintly, and after that he did not feel disposed to count any more. It was a godless sound, one of those low-keyed insidious outrages of nature which are not meant to be. To call it a dull wail, a doom-dragged whine, or hopeless howl of chorused anguish and stricken flesh, without mind would be to miss its most quintessential loathsomeness and soul-sickening overtones. Was it for this that Ward had seemed to listen on the day he was removed? It was the most shocking thing that Willett had ever heard, and it continued from no determinate point as the doctor reached the bottom of the steps and cast his torchlight around the lofty corridor, walls surmounted by cy cyclopean vaultings and pierced by numberless black, or, yeah, numberless black archways. The hall in which he stood was perhaps 14 feet high to the middle of the vaulting and 10 or 12 feet broad. Its pavement was of large, chipped flagstones, and its walls and roof were of dressed masonry. In length, he could not imagine for it stretched ahead indefinitely into the blackness. Of the archway, some had doors of the old six-paneled colonial type, whilst others had none. Overcoming the dread induced by the smell and the howling, Willett began to explore these archways one by one, finding beyond them rooms with groin stone ceilings, each of medium size and apparently of bizarre uses. Most of them had fireplaces, the upper courses of whose chimneys would have formed an interesting study in engineering. Never before or since had he seen such instruments or suggestions of instruments which here loomed on every hand through the burying dust and cobwebs of a century and a half, in many cases evidently shattered as if by ancient raiders. For many of the chambers seemed wholly untrodden by modern feet, and must have represented the earliest and more obsolete phases of Joseph Kerwin's experimentations. Finally, there came a room of obvious modernity, or at least recent occupancy. There were oil heaters, bookshelves and tables, chairs and cabinets, and a desk piled high with papers of varying antiquity and contemporaneousness. Uh, contemporaneousness. That's, that's a long word. Candlesticks and oil lamps stood about in several places, and finding a box of matches handy, Willett lighted such as were ready to use. In the fuller gleam, it appeared that this apartment was nothing less than the latest study or library of Charles Ward, of the books the doctor had seen many before, and a good part of the furniture had plainly come from the Prospect Street mansion. Here and there was a piece well known to Willett, and the sense of familiarity became so great that he had half forgot the noisomeness and the wailing, both of which were plainer here than they had been at the foot of the steps. His first duty, as planned long ahead, was to find and seize any papers which might seem of vital importance, especially those portentous documents found by Charles so long ago behind the picture in Olney Court. As he searched, he perceived how stupendous a task the final unraveling would be, for file on file was stuffed with papers and curious hands bearing curious designs, so that months or even years might be needed for a thorough deciphering and editing. Once he found large packets of letters with praying and raucous postcards, and in writing clearly recognizable as Orne's and Hutchinson's, all of which he took with him as a part of a bundle to be removed in his valley. 
At last, in a locked mahogany cabinet, once gracing the ward home, Willet found the batch of old Kerwin papers, recognizing them from the reluctant glimpse of Charles had granted him so many years ago. The youth had evidently kept them together very much as they had been when he found them, since all the titles recalled by the workmen were present except the papers addressed to Orne and Hutchinson and the cipher with its key. Willett placed the entire lot in his valise and continued his examination of the files. Since young Ward's immediate condition was the greatest matter at stake, the closest search was done among the most obvious recent matter, obviously recent matter, and in this abundance of contemporary manuscript, one very baffling oddity was noted. That oddity was the slight amount in Charles's normal writing, which indeed included nothing more recent than two months before. On the other hand, there were literally reams of symbols and formulae, historical notes and philosophical comment, in a crabbed penmanship absolutely identical with the ancient script of Joseph Kerwin, though of undeniably modern dating. Plainly, a part of the latter-day program had been a sedulous imitation of the old wizard's writing, which Charles seems to have carried to a marvelous state of perfection. Of any third hand which might have been Allen's, there was not a trace. If he had indeed come to be the leader, he must have forced young Ward to act as his amanuensis. Em, amanuensis. I'm just not sure what that means. In this new material, one mystic formula, or rather paraformula, recurred so often that Willett had it by heart by the before he had half finished this quest. It consisted of two parallel columns, the left-handed one surmounted by the archaic symbol called Dragon's Head, that used an almanac to indicate the ascending node, and the right-hand one a corresponding sign of the dragon's tail, or the descending node. The appearance of the whole was something like this, and almost unconsciously the doctor realized that the second half was no more than the first written sil uh, syllabically backward, with the exception of the final monosyllables, and of the odd name yog sothoth which he had come to recognize under various spellings and from other things he had seen in connection with this horrible matter. The formula were as follows, exactly so, as Willett is abundantly able to testify, and the first one struck an odd note of uncomfortable latent memory in his brain, which he recognized later when reviewing the events of the horrible Good Friday of the previous year. Okay, so it, it, you guys can see it's, it's got this here. That's what I'm going to read out is these two columns. So this is, this is the stuff under the dragon's head, which is Yang Yanga Yog Sothoth. Healy Glub, Feather Throdog, and Hua. And then under the dragon's tail, there's um, Og Throd Aif, which is, yeah, it's just like uh, the backwards version of another one of those. Gebli, Yog Sothoth, which is, I guess they just don't do that backwards. Nagangai, and Zero. Words. So haunting were these formulae, and so frequently did he come upon them, that before the doctor knew it, he was repeating them under his breath. Eventually, however, he felt he had secured all papers he could digest to advantage for the present, hence resolved to examine no more till he could bring the skeptical alienists en masse for an ample and more systematic raid. He had still to find the hidden laboratory, so leaving his valise in the lighted room, he emerged again into the black, noisome corridor whose vaulted, vaulting echo echoed ceaselessly with that dull and hideous whine. The next few rooms he tried were all abandoned or filled with crumbling boxes and ominous-looking leaden coffins, but impressed him deeply with the magnitude of Joseph Kerwin's original operations. He thought of the slaves and seamen who had disappeared, and of the graves which had been violated in every part of the world, and of what that final raiding party must have seen, and then he decided it was better not to think anymore. Once a great stone staircase surmounted, surmounted at his right, and he deduced that this must have reached to one of the Kerwin outbuildings. Perhaps the famous stone edifice with the high slit-like windows provided the steps he had descended to from the steep-roofed farmhouse. Suddenly the walls seemed to fall away ahead, and the stench and the wailing grew stronger. Willett saw that he had come across a vast open space, so great that his torchlight would not carry across it. And as he advanced, he encountered occasional stout pillars supporting the arches of the roof. After a time, he reached a circle of pillars grouped like the monoliths of Stonehenge and with carved 
altar, uh, with a large carved altar on the base of three steps in the center. And so curious were the carvings on that altar that he approached to study them with his electric light. But when he saw what they were, he shrank away, shuddering, and did not stop to investigate the dark stains which discolored the upper surface. It had spread down the sides in occasional thin lines. Instead, he found the distant wall and traced it as it swept around a gigantic circle, perforated by occasional black doorways and indented by a myriad shallowed cells, iron gratings, and wrist and ankle bonds on chains fastened to the stone of the concave rear masonry. These cells were empty, but still the horrible odor and the dismal moaning continued, more insistent now than ever, and seemingly varied at times by a sort of slippery thumping. Yeah, and that's where we're going to stop for today's reading. So he's gone down into the bad place, which is what everybody does, and we'll get to see how this all ends in the final part next time. Thank you guys once again for being here through this reading of The Case of Charles Dexter Ward.